All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Immune Deficiency Foundation's Skid Compass Lunch and Learn. Today, we are exploring organ function and long-term outcomes following hematopoietic stem cell transplant for Skid with Dr. Ami Shah. My name is Emma Martins, and I'm the Program Manager of Community Relations at IDF. On behalf of all of us at the Immune Deficiency Foundation, I'd like to thank you for joining us today for this program. We are excited to host this event for the IDF community. IDF is dedicated to fostering a community empowered by education. We want you to remember that IDF is committed to our community, serving you as a trusted resource through the use of technology and innovation. We are here to give you the tools and information to become empowered and offer you our compassion, understanding, and support to emphasize that you are not alone on your journey. Today's program is part of IDF's regular series of bite-sized programming that will provide diagnosis-specific information and support to our community wherever they may be. Before we begin, I would like to point out a few housekeeping items to keep in mind for today's program. This afternoon, we are using the Zoom webinar feature, and attendees should be able to see the slides and our panelists and also hear myself and our panelists speak. Attendees will not be able to activate their video camera or their microphone. There will be the opportunity for questions at the end of the presentation, and you are welcome to submit any questions you have as you think of them throughout the session. Please type them in the Q&A box in the control panel on your screen. Please do not include any personal health information, as all questions will be anonymous and read aloud. A brief disclaimer. Please remember that information presented during this forum is not intended to be a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. We are here today as a trusted source and friend to provide you with information. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health provider with questions concerning a medical condition. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay seeking it based on information presented during an educational forum or event. Today's program is offered in partnership with the CalSkid Long-Term Follow-Up Project. Many of you tuning in today are doing so because you are an individual, parent, caregiver, or friend to someone living with severe combined immunodeficiency or SCID. SCID Compass, an educational program of the Immune Deficiency Foundation, was created back in 2018 with the purpose of guiding parents, families, and the medical community through the journey of learning about this rare, life-threatening medical disorder and find support to navigate the health challenges along the way. All of our SCID Compass resources can be found by visiting www.skidcompass.org. The web website offers a robust variety of both online and printable materials for anyone eager to learn more about this condition or share information with others. Topics cover every step in a family SCID journey from newborn screening to return home after treatment and everything in between. You can view the website in Spanish, French, English, German, Portuguese, and Tagalog by clicking on select the language in the upper navigation. We also offer monthly lunch and learns and support all of the great programming IDF offers to the PI community. And now I am so pleased to introduce our presenter for today. Ami Shah is a clinical professor of pediatrics specializing in hematology and oncology at the Lucille Packard Children's Hospital and Stanford School of Medicine. Welcome, Dr. Shah. Okay, thank you everyone for inviting me here um, and to Skid Cal. Um, so today what I've been asked to do is talk to you about late effects as well as survivorship following stem cell transplantation and try to really focus in on some of the new data that the PIDTC has um, received from the um, previous retrospective analysis of SCID patients. So, um, and uh, so we're gonna divide this up into two sections. The first section is just an overall late effects that occurs after transplantation. And the second half really focus in on the 6902 study. There are many potential late effects that can occur after transplantation, um, and, and these may be related to other complications that patients have after transplantation, including chronic GVHD, iron overload, the number of infections uh, that patients had either prior to transplantation or during transplantation, organ dysfunction of the heart, lungs, the kidneys, um, endocrinopathies such as hypogonadism and growth hormone deficiencies, um, bone dis abnormalities, dental abnormalities, and neurocognitive and secondary malignancies. Dr. Shah, really quick before you continue, um, did you want to pull up your slides? Oh, my slides aren't showing? Nope. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> let's see. Let me go back to here and 
Uh, sorry about that. Okay, so um, let's see now from current slide. Okay, sorry about that. Good okay. to go, thank you. <laughs> So um, this is uh, just kind of the schemat of just what I just spoke about. Um, the etiology of late effects really occurs in multiple different forms. The primary disease, um, previous treatment that the patient had. For skid patients, many patients prior to the newborn screening came in because of an infection, as many of you may know. And those infections took a long time to recover before patients even came to transplant. So we can't just ignore that patients had sometimes were on a ventilator or had pulmonary dysfunction coming into transplantation. Um, the type of transplant patients had, some people had a sibling donor transplant, some people had an unrelated donor transplant, and some people had what's called a haploidentical transplant from one of the parents. Some people received uh, no conditioning. Some people received a fully myeloblative conditioning. Some people were transplanted very quickly after transplant after birth um, because they were a family history of it, of skid, and they were able to come in quickly. Other people had to wait for years before they were actually in a stable condition and we had a donor available. And then as obviously the acute transplant complications and graft versus host disease. So I wanna take a case study. Um, so RE is an 11 year old female, and this is not a real case study. So this is kind of an amalgamation of a lot of things. Um, an 11 year old female with a history of skid or Omen's disease. She is 10 years posting nine out of 10 matched unrelated donor bone marrow transplantation. Her conditioning at the time of uh, at one year of age was busulfan, cytoxan, and ATG. And I'll just point out that we used to use this very frequently as our conditioning regimen um, 10 years ago. We now do not use such intensive. We don't give two alkylators such as busulfan and cytoxan. Most people will do busulfan fludarabine or something less. But this was a pretty toxic regimen for some of these patients back then. Many patients developed, uh, I'm sorry, with RE developed severe graft versus host disease of the GI tract and of her skin, which was treated with steroids. Um, because of her steroids, she had a lot of infectious complications. And one of those included disseminated aspergillus, which is a fungus, due to all the immunosuppression. And she received a prolonged treatment of amphotericin. So in terms of her late effects, she developed multiple complications chronic GV, and we're going to go through these and talk about why they happen. So chronic graft versus host disease varies anywhere between 20 to 85 percent, depending on the type of conditioning regimen and the type of transplant patients received. The risk factors included transplant source, an unrelated versus a sibling donor. The donor characteristics, the older you are, the more likely you have graft versus host disease, um, as well as your um, the, if you've been a female and you've had multiple pregnancies as the donor, that also induced more graft versus host disease. The patient characteristics, for example, if they had um, omens, patients um, tended to have more graft versus host disease because their skin was already quite inflamed. And again, the history of acute graft versus host disease can increase the risk of chronic graft versus host disease. Um, the surveillance for chronic graft versus host disease consisted of laboratory examinations, pulmonary function testing, as well as assessing the joints. And the first line of treatment was oftentimes things that are immunosuppressive, especially steroids. Okay, so infection. When you were in the initial inf um, transplant period, there are certain infections that you tended to have, and they were related to acute graft versus host disease or just being neutropenic. In the post-engraftment period, oftentimes viral infections tended to be the biggest problem, especially things like CMV or EBV, uh, post-transplant lymphoproliferative disease. In the later phases, which is what we're talking about today, there are certain patients that still don't have complete immune reconstitution. And what that means is they're at risk of bacterial infections or um, viral, especially varicella, zoster infections, and um, pneumocystis potentially. Um, and these are the things that we worry about making sure that you're protected against getting another infection later on until your immune system completely recovers. Endocrinopathies. Endocrinopathies means the hormones that your body naturally should make, but sometimes are decreased because of the fact you've had a transplant. For example, um, the, there's oftentimes some of these patients later on in life will develop hyperthyroidism and require a thyroid hormone. 
Some will have adrenal insufficiency because they've been on steroids for a prolonged period of time. And when that happens, sometimes they have to stay on low doses of steroids just to help them out. Um, what it, what that means is that what our body tends to do is it's a fight or flight. Um, if I put my hand on a stove, my hand knows to completely remove it from the stove if it's getting burned. If you don't have adrenal, um, if you're adrenal insufficient, your body doesn't know how to respond to activities in the same way. And therefore you might keep your hand on that stove a little bit faster because you can't remove it as quickly. So that's why sometimes they're on low dose steroids to make sure they have that fight or flight. Growth hormone deficiency. Many patients that are on steroids for a very prolonged period of time are shorter in their long term. And when we do in later effects clinic is we monitor the growth hormone to check and say, hey, can they? Does their body have the ability to grow, um, or is it just delayed growth? Um, and then we look at the pubertal function, which is the gonadal failure. Um, usually, I don't start testing kids until they're after seven years of age because. Before that, they may not be, everybody's variable in when they start making their growth hormone, I mean, their uh, pubertal hormones. But then we monitor them for, because some of our patients will require additional support to help them get into puberty. And obviously, um, fertility is another section we'll talk about. So let's, what causes adrenal insufficiency? Prolonged steroid use, especially high-dose steroid uses. Um, Although skid patients don't get radiation, um, radiation is also another thing that causes adrenal insufficiency. How do we stop this kind of adrenal insufficiency? We really have to go very slowly on weaning steroids. And this is hard because when you look at your child, you say, hey, he looks great. Let's get him off the steroids quickly because I know it has other side effects. But if you go too fast, their body doesn't respond well. So we have to go really slowly. And we check the morning cortisol level to make sure we, their body is able to make cortisol on its own. We survey them by checking their morning cortisol as well as um, an ACTH stimulation test if necessary. Now, some people who've been on steroids for a really long period of time, if they get fevers or have to have a major surgery, we actually will give them stress dosing so that their body knows how to respond to it, an event that's happening to them on the outside. In terms of growth hormone, and, and most of the data on growth disturbances are oftentimes on patients who received radiation. However, um, skid patients do not usually get radiation. So luckily our patients, um, all of you, did not get radiation. So this is not the same as a patient who had leukemia. But what I will say for this um, is that when patients are on steroids, um, they will have a delay in their growth. They might be able to catch up. It depends on what age they were and how long they're on steroids. Some people are so suppressed, though, that their, their brain can't make the hormones necessary. So the way we monitor this by looking at their height and weight on every visit, as well as looking at their tanner staging, which is how much pubertal um, development they have at our different visits. If I start seeing that patients are flattening off on the growth hormone and their growth, then I'll go ahead and make sure they're seen by our endocrinologist. So there's a conversation about whether they need to be on growth hormone replacement or not. Growth hormone replacement also has its toxicity. So I don't say, necessarily say that that's the best or the only thing that we can do. Um, some people will elect to say, hey, I don't need my child to be six foot five inches tall, right? Like I'm okay with it, but they're uh, five foot six or five foot seven. Um, so that's a discussion that has to be had with an endocrinologist who's experienced in this area. So the next thing that can happen is some of our organ dysfunction. And, and, and we're going to start off with renal dysfunction. Remember RE also had um, not only steroid, severe graft versus host disease, but they also had um, disseminated aspergillus that was treated with amphotericin, which is a very nephrotoxic agent. And many of you that have had a transplant many years ago had infections that required significant amount of antibiotic or antimicrobial therapy that affects the kidneys. So what do we mean by chronic kidney disease? Chronic kidney disease is defined by patients who have what's called a glomerular filtration rate or GFR that's less than 60. 
for greater than three months. Um, in addition, if those have one of greater than 60, then it is accompanied by structural damage to the kidney. And that we know by when we check, when we have your children come to clinic and we sometimes have them give us a sample of their urine, we're looking to see is the kidneys functioning well? Do they make, do they spill too much protein? Um, are there any other evidence? Of, are there any blood in the urine? Those are signs that say something's going on with the kidneys. And we really make sure we do that on patients who we know have had a lot of nephrotoxic aging. The incidence is about 20%. And I think this is going to go down because most of the patients, especially with those with skid, now are diagnosed off the newborn screening. So we're able to transplant them before they've had serious infections and before they've had a lot of antimicrobial therapies but this data still is unknown yet. Um, many of the other risk factors include um, a history of antihypertensive treatment. Many of the patients who received high doses of steroids became hypertensive and required medications to treat their hypertension. Um, as a result, that can be an effect that happens onto the kidneys as well. Um, the way we monitor this, as we said, is by checking their blood pressures, their laboratory, their chemistries, as well as looking at their urinalysis. And the most important thing is we really need to have good blood pressure control because that is oftentimes contributing to the increasing renal dysfunction. Very few patients need dialysis long term. Most of my patients don't. Um, so therefore, I'm, you know, but if it's really, really severe and very, very prolonged, that is an option for some families pulmonary complications that happen after transplantation. Patients will, can sometimes after transplant have either restrictive lung disease or obstructive lung disease. And these are the definitions. Obstructive lung disease is something called bronchiolitis obliterans, which is graft versus host disease of the lungs. Um, and those some are very difficult to sometimes diagnose because they oftentimes may require a um, biopsy of the lungs. The risk factors are primarily graft versus host disease. Age, the older you are, the more likely you're gonna have this. Infections coming into transplant. So as I said before, many of the patients that we had had in the past were not diagnosed off the newborn screening. They were diagnosed because they were infected coming in, especially during the viral seasons, such as now RSV, influenza, um, we didn't have COVID back in the day, but you know, obviously there's patients that are going to be exposed to viral infections before the diagnosis of skid, and therefore they many times will come in with such really significantly diseased lungs that we have to monitor that closely. And what we did learn from Sun Young's Pi New England Journal paper, um, when they retrospectively looked at the um, patients that had been transplanted more than 10 years ago, we know that patients that were infected if they received a conditioning regimen, they did worse than those that did not receive a conditioning regimen. That's only for those that were came in with infections specifically. And how do we look at this though? We look at their clinical, obviously if patients are having difficulty breathing, we know that that's a, that's a concern and we need to check. Pulmonary function tests are the tests where you breathe into a machine and then you hold your breath and then you breathe out, breathe out as forcibly. You have to form a, your mouth has to make a tight seal around the tube. So therefore I usually don't do this test on anybody before the age of seven because they aren't able to comply. And even at seven, some kids can't comply specifically. So it's really difficult to be able to do pulmonary function tests on kids that are really less than eight years of age. Um, but we can get a high resolution CT scan to really assess what is going on in the lungs in terms of why they're having this kind of difficulty difficulty in bucelfam. One of the complicate, one of the, the reasons that people do get bu uh, pulmonary complications can be the use of bucelfam. Um, now, I haven't had too many patients that have had pulmonary complications just from bucelfam. It's really been those patients who have been developed severe gra chronic graft versus host disease. And again, unfortunately, a lot of this is um, immunosuppressive therapy and supportive therapy. Um, we do have newer agents that are available now that helps decrease some of the fibrosis that we were seeing back then, um, but these are newer drugs that are just started. So hopefully we can continue to decrease the amount of pulmonary complications. In terms of skeletal, um, osteoporosis, which many of you know about, means a bone mineral density score that's below two. In combination, 
combination with fractures. Um, and the risk factors for this, again, is total body radiation, which our skid patients don't receive, steroids, which many of our skid patients do receive, and ovarian failure, which many transplant patients develop after they receive chemotherapy. Um, and you know, we have to monitor the, for this. Um, so the way we survey this is by doing something called a DEXA scan. Um, a DEXA scan, though, is not valid until you're past puberty. So we don't get DEXA scans until patients are about 18 years of age. And what we can do besides a DEXA scan, though, is every year we'll monitor a vitamin D level. Um, vitamin D is, is we've learning now, is very, very important for patients, all patients, um, all people, actually, not even just patients, um, uh, everybody I know, you know, we the only places you can get vitamin D are from two sources, the sun. And we do, do a good job about telling people to stay out of the sun because that's got its own problems. Um, and the other place is from drinking dairy products, which is hit or miss for some children. So the other ways we can um, improve uh, vi the vitamin D level is by doing weight-bearing exercises. Well, if you're also you know, fatigued, and if you're on steroids, your muscle mass isn't great, it's hard to do a lot of weight-bearing exercise. So giving a medic patients as pill a day, which is called vitamin D, can sometimes help that and improves that bone strength. Gonadal failure. So for females, that can result, that we can see in patients when they have irregular or absent menses. And, and an FSH, which we test for yearly after kids are in a certain age range, that's in the postmenopausal range. For males, it looks like an elevated FSH and a low testosterone that can cause primarily testicular failure and impaired spermatogenesis. And this is something that we look at in our late effects clinics on patients after they've hit seven to eight years of age. Um, prior to that, it's really hard to do anything specifically because they're all in prepubertal phases. The clinical the presentation of these patients looks like delayed pubertal development based on what's called a tanner staging. For example, for a female, we'll look and see, um, do they have breast development? Um, what is their... Um, their vaginal area look like? Um, do they Are they developing appropriately to the phases of becoming a woman? <clears throat> for men, it's also um, similar, but in the opposite end, you know, we'll look for the hair presence of hair and the, the growth of their testes. The risk factors for this, are, again, are all the chemotherapy, bucelfan or radiation. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and the way we monitor that is by hormone levels. And this is something I do on all of my patients every single year. And I assess whether they're hitting what they should be at their age level. If they're not, and it's starting to get a little bit older, then I'll get them referred to our endocrinology team to assess. Now, I won't have them get hormone replacement therapy until they're in their early teens, um, like 13 or 14, mostly because you want it, they may be delayed and I don't want to make them have to get something too soon. But this is obviously a conversation you have with your endocrinologist. Um, now, long term, when the women are older, they really need to have annual and gynecological exams and annual mam mammograms after the age of 35. Um, and that also depends a little bit on, on family history. But it's really important that we, you know, monitor patients for um, cancers that may occur later on in life. Um, how do we prevent gonadal failure? And this is a hard one for obviously patients with skid because they're quite young. A um, lot of new techniques have come into play. So now we can do um, testicular tissue or ovarian tissue biopsies and have that cryopreserved. I will caution, even though that technique is now available, that doesn't mean any of the kids are old enough that we have uh, knowledge that they have had children from that procedure. Um, you know, so we are able to do that in young children less than near one year of age. Um, but of course, you know, now that this techniques has only been a few years old, all those kids are still less than five years of age and clearly nobody less than five needs to have a child of their own. Um, we do have to think about hormone replacement, but there are complications with hormone replacement. So it's really important to have a very comprehensive discussion with the endocrinology team to make sure this is the right therapy and when that right therapy should start. 
the next thing is, is um, skeletal or avascular necrosis. So what happens is when patients are on high doses of steroids, um, that steroids tends to um, cause enough fat in the bone marrow cavity that prevents blood flow to certain big joints, especially your hips. And so that leads to a, a lack of blood supply, um, which is called necrosis, and it can uh, destroy the joint surfaces. Hip joint is the primary one, but the knees are not, not also affected. Um, and it can be seen pretty late post-transplantation. Um, the most significant um, risk factors are steroids, as I talked about, and male children are at higher risk than female children. Don't ask me why. Um, it doesn't make sense. I would have, if I had a multiple choice guess, I would have probably said females because we tend to have more hormonal changes and we have, we develop more weight on our hips, but um, males are seem to be the ones that get um, hip or avascular necrosis more. So we monitor that and the signs and symptoms are going to be that they have pain in their joints. And then what I'll do is I'll, I'll get an MRI to look at that joint carefully and get them to the orthopedic surgeons. Some people get a little bit of a minor surgery to relieve some of the pressure, and that improves things. Unfortunately, many children long-term will need to have a joint replacement because of the, the amount of um, destruction that's been happening on their bones. And finally, dental. Um, dental is, is related to the age of transplant, chronic graft versus host disease, and again, the conditioning regimen. And what can happen with dental, and it's hard because most of our skid patients are transplanted when they're very young, less than two years of age. And so we may not even know some of these late effects of the dental because they don't occur until after you have your adult tooth teeth come in. But what we'll see in some of the adult tooth is they may have poor root development, premature apical closures. They're at higher risk of having dental caries because of the chemotherapy. The enamels can be dysplastic and you can have an abnormal eruption of the teeth and periodontal disease because many children, it's, it's hard, you know, after transplant, it's hard to really brush teeth very carefully because of the counts. And so that can increase those uh, risk factors. So everybody should get a dental exam twice a year. We all should. Um, and we do have radiographic exams once the kids are able to do that to really look and make sure the dental, the teeth are erupting normally. The next side effect that can happen is liver dysfunction. And this is primarily related to blood transfusions and TPN, um, as well as medication toxicities. Um, the complication that really occurs with a lot of blood transfusions is, red, is iron overload. And when red cells break down in our body, they release iron and iron has to go somewhere. Um, and primarily it goes into our liver, but it can go into our pancreas. And if it's really bad, it goes around our heart. Most skid patients don't have this complications because we really don't give a lot of blood transfusions. They otherwise have a normal red blood cell manufacturing. However, TPN can also cause patients to have fatty liver disease as well as steroids. And of course, some of the medications we have can also um, affect our livers because they're cleared through our liver and that can cause a hepatitis. Um, so we monitor these kids frequently for their, their liver enzymes. And we will also look at their iron load in their body. Um, and if they have a higher amount of iron, then we can get something called a T2 star to make sure they don't have too much iron. And as again, most of our skid patients, once they've been grafted, they don't require lots of blood transfusions unless something else has been going on. So this is less of an issue for them to have too much iron in their body. Um, but we do monitor it very, very closely. Now, many of you guys have always asked me about what happens in school. And this is a big issue. Um, we currently are doing a study through the PIDTC where we are assessing patients between 6 and 16 years of age who've had skin and head transplant um, and looking and seeing what their neurocognition looks like. Um, if you haven't heard about this um, and you're between 6 and 16 years of age, you can ask your primary physician about the neurodevelopmental study through the PIDTC. Not all centers, unfortunately, have a neuropsychologist to do the training, but um, if, if your site doesn't, if your, your physician doesn't have, a, uh, doesn't have this open there because they don't have a neuropsychologist, ask him if there's a way to get tested locally somewhere else. Um, but this is only for patients that have been on a previous PIDTC study. <laughs> 
what we do know from the neurocognitive effects is that, that some people will have difficulties in reading um, and memory. My memory tends to be the biggest thing. They tend to have um, impaired or they have shortened attention spans and therefore leads to poor school performance. Now, this is what happens in patients that have a transplant overall. Um, we're still waiting to find out what happens with most of the skids. I've done a study where I've looked at um, patients with skid where I had the one-year, three-year, and five-year um, evaluations of patients. Um, and I was able to show on those particular patients, and I think we had about 10 patients that had one three-year and five-year. And the first few years after transplantation, these patients were definitely delayed. Um, they were delayed for multiple reasons, though. Number one, none of them were in school yet. They were tended to be relatively still isolated um, away from big crowds, et cetera, because their, their parents were obviously know what the risks of going around a lot of people were. But once they got into school, their growth, their learning curve went like this. Um, and they all were able to catch up in terms of an average neuro, a normal neurocognitive assessment at the age by the time they hit kindergarten. So we, what we did is we took patients who um, were had skid as well as their control match sibling. And both, all, both the kid as well as the sibling were tested every two years. And we were able to see that we, so that way we took away the effects of their environment. And we really just talked about what's the difference between this kid and the family and this kid and the family. And obviously nothing's perfect because you know kids are all different, right? On the other hand, and what we were able to show is despite the fact that the first few years after transplantation, the kids had a delay in their neurocognitive function, by the time they hit kindergarten, they all were back to where they should have been, where their siblings were. Um, and the best way to assess these patients is really to do a full neurocognitive assessment on them. Um, you know, sometimes um, what we do is we really rely on the school. So once kids are back and going back to school, I make sure that I talk to the the guidance counselor or the teachers and make sure they understand what they've been through. And then they get a, either an IEP. So we really get this sense after the teachers have gotten to know the child, what their strengths are, what their weaknesses are, and what we need to do next. And, and that's not necessarily a bad thing, but it's just making sure that they get the support that they need because they haven't been um, around a lot of kids. What we are are seeing now with COVID over the last few years is a lot of children have had some neurocognitive declines compared to years past. And that is primarily because learning online is much different than learning in person with other kids. And most kids also learn by being around other children and mimicking them. Um, and then obviously long-term we're seeing some psychological dysfunction um, of depression, anxiety, adjustment disorders, and PTSD, but this is a really not flushed out area. Um, and so we'll talk about that. So I wanna talk, spend the second half of this conversation talking about the PIDTC data, which is the primary immune deficiency transplant. And what we did is we looked at patients um, that were enrolled on what's called the 6902 trial, which was really a retrospective review of patients that were transplanted more than 10 years ago. Um, and what happens on these particular patients is this was just retrospective. So people just looked back at the charts. So there was no focus specific questions that people were asked. Um, and this manuscript will be um, submitted soon, I hope. And so it's basically patients, there were 662 patients that were on this trial between 1982 and 2012. And of those, 263 of them were, ex um, were excluded because some had expired prior to transplant or received a second transplant. So this does not include any of the second transplants. Um, of this study, 76% were male. The median age was a, at time of transplant was 131 days, and the median follow-up was eight years, but some people were more than 32 years out. Okay. Um, and these are some of the transplant characteristics. Almost half, 40% of the patients had had an active infection at the time of transplant. So we're talking about the patients that were not diagnosed from the newborn screening. Um, though we did have um, some patients that had no infection and some patients that had had an infection that resolved at the time of transplant. 70% of the patients did not receive any conditioning regimen um, and only 20% received a myeloblative conditioning regimen. Again, this is really old data, so reduced intensity um, that there were very few patients, which is kind of what we're doing right now is mostly a reduced intensity conditioning regimens. 58% um, of the patients had a haplotransplant. 
which is a transplant from one of the parents. And sorry, this is on top of me, but most of the patients received a bone marrow. Okay, so this is a little bit of a complicated slide, and so I want to go through it. So of the patients, of the 399 patients, 25% of them had just one organ um, affected, 6.5% had two organs, 10% had uh, three organs, and 1% had four organs, and you can see very small numbers had five and six organs that were affected, and this is looking at two years post-transplant. The cumulative instance of any organ dysfunction, or CLE, which is a chronic late effect, increased over time. So at two years, there was 25% of the patients that had a late effect. At five years, that increased to 30%. At 10 years, it was about 35%. And from the patients that we had data on at 15 years, we're at 41%. Um, and again, part of the problem with this type of a study is that 15 years is a long time. So many patients fell off or got lost to follow up. So we don't have tons of data on every single patient. The three most common organs that were affected um, amongst the patient population we're talking about was the patients that had neurological dysfunctions, developmental dysfunctions, and dental dysfunctions. And these are the, the prevalence of these over time. And you can see that they mostly increased, except for the neuro, neuro did increase, but it, maybe it's stabilizing out. It's hard to tell right now because we don't have the data beyond this. So let's talk about neurological complications. The neurological complications that were primarily present were motor disturbances, hearing, speech, or visual disturbances, and seizures. Now remember, these are all patients that were very old. So many patients also had had an infection or a complication coming into transplantation. Some of the patients did have men had a diagnosis of meningitis, um, but because the symptoms persisted beyond two years, they're counted as a late effects. Other complications that were seen in the neuro group was in less than 1% was cerebral palsy. Um, I, I question this, but I think it was sometimes patients got diagnosed as having cerebral palsy palsy leers after transplantation, um, as opposed to in the beginning when they were already babies. Um, headaches, neuropathies, and um, transient ischemic attacks, which are like small strokes. Developmental complications that happened included global developmental delays. And global developmental delays means patients that have complications not only in their development, but also in their motor skills and behavioral delays. We did not specifically ask these types of questions, but six patients reported having depression, six for patients reported having attention deficit or attention deficit hyperactivity, three patients reported having being diagnosed as autism, and one were patient reported as severe anxiety. Now these were just patient, these were just things that the data managers filled in as opposed to a specific area. So it's really hard to say that this is um what happens in a lot of patients because some patients may not have been asked those questions at their institution and therefore it wasn't written in their notes. As we move forward on PIDT2 trial, we've learned a lot from this previous thing. So our capture forms of what we need to ask for has really improved. So we will be able to capture this moving forward. Um, and some patients, as I said, did explore, not only ex um, report depression, but they also reported anxiety and attention deficit. The dental complications include caries, a lot of caries, decay, maldevelopment, and that means that the tooth is not being shaped for normally, um, and they have to do something to the tooth to kind of make it more um, normal. It's not like riz as opposed to like a little sharp tooth almost. Um, some patients had missing permanent teeth, and that was seen on x-rays when the teeth weren't coming in. They could do an x-ray and see, oh, they never was. there's no adult teeth even there. And poor dentition was a very big comment on some of the patients. Again, this was a lot of, even that we, what the way the question was worded was, were there dental complications? And some people wrote in what the dental complications and other people just marked, yes, there was a dental complication. In terms of growth, remember we talked about the Z-score of less than um, negative two. So in the two to five year time point post-transplantation, 44% had a Z-score that was less than the 25th percentile, 
and 23% of them had a z-score that was less than fifth percentile, which is significantly decreased growth. At the six to 10 year mark though, 46% had a z-score less than 25th percent and 21% had a z-score less than 5%. Um, so in general, what I'm saying is, is many of the patients did have a decrease in their growth um, coming into uh, after transplantation, at least 25% of these patients. 2.3% of the patients developed a second developed a malignancy post transplant most of those patients developed the lymphoma or lymphoproliferative disease and if you remember for patients with skid they have low t cells but they have b cells and what can happen is if you don't get normal t cell numbers and function coming back after transplant there's nothing to keep your b cells under control so these patients become at risk of developing what's called an EBV lymphoma or lymphoproliferative disease. And that is why we're seeing this type of disease coming out post-transplantation. 0.6% of the patients had a non-melanomatous skin malignancy. Unfortunately, many people will get skin cancers because of the amount of sun exposure that they had, especially back then um, when tanning was a lovely thing. Um, and so this is something that we still need to monitor for um, because we don't have um, we don't know. I would assume that as time goes on, there will be more malignancies, but it may not necessarily just be related to the transplant itself. Most of parents, the first thing they want to know, will my kid have a child? And I don't have great answers for you after this, but I do want to share with you what we learned from this particular study, and hopefully we'll have more data as time goes on. Remember, these are patients that are, um, this is just what we have reported in, in the data registry. Um, patients that have kids, just as a preface before we get into this, patients that have kids are usually in a stable relationship. Um, not that you, you, so it's hard because girls can have kids once they start having their menses. Boys can have kids very early. That doesn't mean they should be having kids. Um, and they, sh mo most of them are not gonna be in a stable relationship. So of the females, there was um, 33 females that were greater than 14 years of age. I use that number to say that by 14 years of age, most girls have started having their menses. Not every girl though, okay? Um, but we you had to pick a, um, a, a time point where we said, this is the point where we're saying females should have had their period, okay? Of those girls, 80% of them achieved menarche. And um, 11, of them had, 11 of them had no conditioning, five had just immunosuppressive therapy, three had a reduced intensity, and five of them had a, a, um, a myeloblative conditioning regimen, okay? Three of those who received an unconditioned transplant had a child, okay? Again, this was, not a, this was a question that was asked, but in order to have a child, hopefully you're you're at an older age and we don't have lots of follow-up on patients 20 years and beyond. So this is just something that they, that just the few that we have. As we move forward, I hope we'll have more long-term follow-up data. There were 300, 302 males in this group. Um, and again, there's not specifically a time point where you can say they were eligible to have a child because guys unfortunately can can have a child earlier than you'd like them to. Three of those reported having a child. None of the three received a conditioning regimen. When, as I said before, we did look at the, I, I also looked at the patients who had had a second transplant. There was two, one girl and one boy who had a conditioning regimen and had because of a second transplant. And those patients, still were able to have a child, one boy and one girl who had a myeloblative conditioning. This is not perfect data. This is just a descriptive section because we don't have an N, a denominator specifically. But as I said, as we move forward in the next round of the PIDTC studies, we'll be hopefully be able to capture this information better. So um, in, in getting closure, um, the factors for chronic late effects um, include pre-transplant infections, especially the neurological complications. As I said before, many of the patients that had infections tended to be the ones that had neurological complications, especially those with, um, with, uh, who had been on a ventilator for a long time or who had had meningitis. 
re reduced intensity and myeloblative conditioning regimens, i.e. busulfan containing regimens, oftentimes had more growth, dental and endocrine abnormalities. Chronic graft versus host disease, regardless of conditioning, tended to have more autoimmune, hepatic, and GI complications. Patients that have Artemis deficiency, DCLR, E1C, most of you that who have Artemis, have children with Artemis deficiencies know that. Um, they had the greatest numbers of uh, chronic late effects. And we know that these patients always have more complications because of their, de their defect. Um, so the takeaways is patients who undergo stem cell transplant are at high risk chronic health conditions. And the consistent long-term follow-up is really the key to identifying and treating late effects of therapy. More research is definitely noted. As I said, this is all a retrospective evaluation, which um, I hope we get out soon, but it's really led us to make better um, case report forms so that we can really capture this information um, moving forward to know what happens to all these children. And with that, um, and again, I will, again, this is what we talked about. So they, most centers don't always, the patients don't always go back to the treating transplant physician. They may not go back to an immunologist. They may go to a late effects clinic. They may just go to their general physician. So trying to decipher what all this information from patients, from notes is really been difficult. Um, and many patients in follow-up also don't go to the same center because families move. Um, most of us will move at least three times in our life and it's inconvenient to get back to the same center. So therefore, a lot of this information is, um, is, is really just looking through what we have available and making the future better for research. And with that, I will stop and ask, have questions. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Shaw. That was a wonderful presentation. And as you said, we will now get into some Q&A. Um, all right. So first question. All right. This individual asked, for all of the tests and yearly monitoring um, that you spoke about as far as keeping on top of your patient's care. Is this something that a patient's primary care provider can do or something that we need to specifically see our skid doctor for? Yeah, that's a, a great question. And the skid, um, the Cal skid is trying to assess that right now. Who are, are you going to for your care? Um, for my patients at Stanford, I bring them back to me. Um, and that's just because I run the late effects clinic. So I could, I, I have a double double hat. Um, some centers um, will send you back to your transplant physician at least once a year. Other places will send you to the um, long-term survivorship clinic at your center. Um, unfortunately, every center is different. Um, and we're trying to assess that right now as we go through um, a lot of the questions we're asking of families. Um, and hopefully we'll have a little bit of make some more guidelines for patients available. But that's a great question. And, and you do have to ask a little, you know, if you are unclear about that answer, you do have to ask your physician, who's doing my late effects? Um, who, where do I go for my survivorship clinic? Should I be going to um, the transplanter or should I contact the transplanter? Just because it is really important that you get into that physician. Certainly, thank you. Um, all right, next question. As the years go on and diagnosis through newborn screening rather than infection becomes the norm, do you imagine we'll see less of these late effect, late effect, effect issues due to previous infections? Yeah, I, that's what we're hoping. Um, that's what we're monitoring for. So there's there's two parts of the 16, the PIDTC trial. The 16, 6902 was all of the retrospectives. Almost nobody on there was on a newborn screening, I, I think. Um, on the 6901, we're now having a lot of patients on the newborn screening. So we're starting to separate out now that we have enough patients. What happened to those who had um, newborn screening and who didn't? Um, Jen Heimel wrote a really lovely uh, a manuscript in blood where she was able able to look at the first 100 patients who were diagnosed off the newborn screening. Um, and there's several more papers coming out regarding the differences. What is interesting, although I thought that, I think every one of us thought there would be less infections, we found out that despite the fact we found you off the newborn screening, many patients still ended up having CMV before transplantation. I don't know why. Um, it was surprising to us. Um, 
you know, some place, sometimes um, patients that are breastfeeding, if the mother has CMV, that CMV can come through the breast milk. Um, but I don't think that was the only reason because many fam many physicians will still say, hold off breastfeeding until we can assess this. Um, so the, these patients didn't necessarily have CMV disease. They just had CMV reactivation and we're assessing that. They are not, patients are not coming in like they used to come in at three to four months of age with RSV infections or um, pneumocystis pneumonia and being on a ventilator as soon as they came in. So it's really the type of infections we're seeing and the severity of the infections has definitely decreased, but we still are waiting to really analyze all that data. But it's a great question. Thank you. All right. And um, it looks like this is our final question. This individual asked, when you say late effects, how early and how late do you think some of these things might start to show up? Um, is it in their teens, 20s, in their 30s and 40s? Yeah, that, that's a great question. It depends a little bit on the effects. Neurological symptoms we tend to see quite early um, post because you'll notice, especially the school teachers, I have Shout out to all of our school teachers. They're really good about assessing when something's wrong, but it really requires parents to be on top of it and to communicate with those teachers and let them know this is what's going on. Many places, many centers will have people to help with school reintegration as well. Um, you know, as a physician, I've oftentimes called the school myself and said, this is what I, I want you to keep an eye on. And request IEPs um, at your, every parent is, every child is, um, has the right to have an IEP. Some schools will give you a pushback. I get it. But if you think that, that your kid's not keeping up, then it's really important to follow up with that. So the neurological or the developmental, you, you're going to see that early on. That's not going to be a all of a sudden later on effect. However, things like dental, you're not going to know until the adult teeth are coming back. So that's going to be in your eight, nine years time frame when your teeth are actually there because um, otherwise you just have baby teeth. In terms of secondary malignancies and endocrinopathies, those unfortunately are going to be later on because it's really the development of the growth. Um, you have to give a kid chance to be able to grow before you're going to know that they aren't growing anymore. Um, and the secondary malignancies, unfortunately, we don't, even for a, a transplant for a leukemia patient, we don't have a stopping point. Um, you know, the, the risk of a secondary malignancy for most other transplants, leukemias, et cetera, is about 10%. But that number is going to continue to climb um, depending on the conditioning regimen. And again, as we all get older, we're all at higher risk of cancers as well. So um, it's a variability in terms of the late effects of when we would see some of those things. Thank you so much. That was a great explanation. Um, all right, so it looks like that is going to wrap up our Q&A. Um, thank you so much again, Dr. Shaw, for putting together this presentation. It was awesome. And thank you to our audience for um, submitting those questions. Okay. And to, to our audience, um, if you have additional questions, you can always ask IDF. Um, go online and submit your questions to ask IDF by visiting the site on your screen or giving us a call at the number on your screen. So now um, we are getting ready to close and we just want to remind you that all IDF programming is truly guided by the needs of the PI community. And therefore um, we are going to launch a quick little poll um, for our audience right now. And we are asking you to let us know um, what is your level of comfort with indoor and in-person events? Um, so really quick, let me launch this little poll. All right, and then if everyone can click on their preferred uh, level of comfort, we'll give it a couple seconds and then um, we will close it out. So um, we really appreciate everyone putting in their uh Thank you, uh, everyone. Response. Go to clinic. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Shaw. We appreciate awesome. it greatly. Thank you. Take care. All right, we'll give it just a couple more minutes for folks to put in their preference. All right, well, thank you everyone for giving us your responses.
So thank you, everyone. And finally, we hope you'll see, we will see you at the next Skid Compass Lunch and Learn, which is coming up on November 30th, where Samantha Childs, who is a certified child life specialist, walks us through pain management and coping for kids in a medical setting. Um, definitely applies to Skid, but other diagnoses as well. So everyone's welcome to attend. And again, we just want to thank Dr. Shaw again for a great and informative presentation. Um, and thank you all for joining us today for this webinar. Um, we really appreciate it. And we hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you so much. Take care.